Okay. Welcome. The past few minutes has been a simulation of the chaos that most of us have been experiencing this semester. Um, right. Welcome to this session. Oh, I'm going back to you. Okay. Are we, you keep going, Mark. I got it. Okay. I, I need to kill the sound on the other meeting. Hi. You're muted, Mark. Okay. Sorry, Mark, I forgot gotcha. you're one of the attendees, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's right. Um, okay, welcome. Um, so did you get my joke? See that this has been a simu uh, simulation of the chaos we've all been facing this semester. Um, okay, this is authors um, learning to adapt their own material for uh, <laughs> online teaching. And what we have is, is uh, there are about 10 uh, EL, Japan based ELT authors here. One exception is Dorothy Zemak, who is now based in um, Oregon in the States, but was in Japan for many years and is still very active. Um, each of the authors will, will do about a 10 minute mini, or not, not a, about half of the authors will do a 10 minute mini presentation about some of the ways they are adapt, adapting their own material. Um, but we're going to ask you to be part of it too, because after the first couple of presentations, we're going to do something called uh, thorns and roses, which is what are the challenges we've been facing and what are the roses? What are the things that have blossomed? But what we'd like to do is start off with Dorothy's presentation, um, if for no other reason, because she's in Eugene, Oregon, where it's midnight. And so uh, we thought it's only, it's only nice to start with her so she can leave the meeting afterwards if she needs to. So Dorothy, can I turn it over to you? Unmute. There, I'm unmuted. Are we ready? Okay, I'm gonna wave and say hello, and then I'm going to turn my video camera off. One thing I have terrible bandwidth here in Eugene, Oregon, because we're under a lot of trees. And the other thing is I've, I'm wearing bifocals, so if I need to look at anything, I do that, and then you look up my nose, and I don't like that. So I'm gonna turn my video off and then move to a PowerPoint screen, because I wanna show you the actual materials. So video off, share screen on, And then we will go from the start. And I will talk about adapting materials to teach online. So these are materials that I've written, which is why I know them intimately. They, these are the, the sources that they're from. I'm gonna kind of whip through that. And I would, for, for the, the assumptions that I'm working with is that if you're talking about adapting materials online, that hopefully your students have the textbook in some format, whether it's a print or a digital copy. That's not absolutely necessary, but if they don't have the book at home, then you'll have to provide them with more information because they'll need to come away from your lesson with something written down and they may, may not take perfect notes. Certainly expect that you have a copy of the textbook, either in paper or digital form. Somehow you're meeting your students online Somehow it's possible for them to interact with each other and with you, whether that's in chat or a breakout room or some other, some other way. But that final assumption that everyone is doing their best. I, I think most students and certainly Japanese students that I've worked with will, will pretty much rise to the level of expectations. So if you assume that they're enthusiastic learners who want to make progress and you go at it with that attitude, it will help everything go better. So the kinds of classes that I teach, we either have a configuration like this with students in individual seats that move, preferably, or we have students at tables where they can sit in clusters or groups. That's what I've been doing for, you know, 15, 20 years for the most part. And that's what I'm missing when I teach online because with either of these configurations, when I want students working with textbook pages, I put them in groups, they go at the task and I wander around and I listen and correct problems as they come up group by group. I can't do that online in the same way. So I had to change the way I present and go through materials just a bit. 
So I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to first show you what the textbook pages look like that you would, you know, if everyone were sitting there in your class with a paper book open, what it would look like, and then what I do online instead. So this is a, a, a two page spread. Like if students had their book open, it would fall like this. It's from a, a lower intermediate writing book. There's a little bit of instruction up there in the upper left, writing focus, what is a paragraph? There's some information on what a paragraph is. And then there's an exercise, right? It says work with a partner, read the groups of sentences, circle the letters of the strong paragraphs. So they get the definition of a paragraph, then they've got to go through and analyze these. If I were teaching face to face, I would go over those instructions. I would probably read them aloud. I might do some eliciting. I probably just lecture, frankly, because that's more efficient. But for that exercise, I would put them in groups. I would have them read the instructions together and then either with a pair or a group go through all of those paragraphs. I think if I did that in a breakout room, not every room would be successful. So when I put it online, it looks like this. I would take that lecture-ish part and I would put it on one slide. Then I would read it, but as I read a couple sentences, I would stop and annotate. So I would read a few sentences and then maybe summarize it or say it another way so that I'm not just reading aloud because students will tune out if you do that. But read, comment, read, comment, read, comment. Then for the exercise instructions, I'm going to take just that so it's large. Again, I'll read through it and, you know, make a little joke about ah, page 10. We don't have a page 10. I'm not going to take the time to retype it, to take that out so that the page 10 reference isn't there anymore. Uh, because I am an author, I often have PDFs of my own textbooks. If I'm using somebody else's textbook and I don't have a PDF, I take out my phone and I take a picture of the page. It won't always look perfect, but it looks good enough. But I don't have time to retype exercises onto PowerPoint slides. So we have the instructions there. Then the first thing to, to analyze, I would just paste that directly under the instructions. I might give students a few moments to read it. I could ask first for volunteers in chat to say whether it's a, a paragraph or not a paragraph and the reasons why. We could, you know, I could unmute some people and call on them, but we do one sort of together. Leaving the instructions up, I go on to the next paragraph. Same thing. I give them some time to read it make some decisions, make some guesses. You can also do this as a, as a poll. How many people think this is a good paragraph? How many people think this is not a good paragraph? So I would go through several examples like that with the instructions still there. Once they have the point, especially for longer paragraphs, I can now take the instructions away. But I'm gonna go through them paragraph by paragraph and leave the instructions up if I need to. This is another example. Uh, from a, a higher level book on essay writing. The topic is how to write for timed exams versus writing, you know, an essay that you do at home and you have three days. But if you have half an hour to write an exam or 45 minutes to, to write an essay question, how do you do that? So this is about half of the textbook page that students would be looking at if they had a paper copy on their desk. You can see we have some information about shortcuts that you take on essay tests. Then again, we have an exercise, underline the keywords of this essay question. Which effect of the California gold rush do you think had the biggest impact on the character of San Francisco today? This is unit 12 in the book. Two units earlier, they've seen a model outline of an essay that was also on the topic of the California gold rush. They don't have a lot of information about it, but they've, they've seen it before. And then we have another exercise of, of evaluating introductory paragraphs. Now, if I, when I presented this online, that's a lot of text to just read to students. So I went with an image and I said, okay, if, if you've got only half an hour or 45 minutes to write an essay, how is that different from when you have several days to write an essay? Are there any shortcuts? So I can elicit ideas from students. I might just talk and give them the information, but I want that nice visual <laughs> to attract their attention. 
whether or not I elicit or let them discuss or I tell them, I do want to summarize the information because it's important, especially if they don't have the textbook. I think this, these particular slides I did with a student who was not holding a copy of the textbook. So I needed to make sure that, that he had the information written down somewhere in case he didn't remember. Then before I go to that essay question, see when I have the textbook and students have the textbook, I can tell them to go back to unit 10 and look at that outline again. I don't really want to take the time to do that online. So again, I'm going to go with a huge visual. Hey, what do you remember about the California gold rush? Maybe they remember nothing. Maybe they remember something. If they remember nothing, I might give them some extra information. Uh, I, I know the, the few times that I've, that I've taught this lesson online, I found myself giving information that wasn't in the textbook. Like, hey, did you know Lu Levi's blue jeans were one result of the California gold rush? To kind of get them warmed up to the topic a bit. Then that question, that first exercise was to underline the key words because that's so important. If you don't underline the key words, you're not gonna be able to answer the question. I would do that together. So I'll give them the question and say, just think in your head, what are, what are the key words here? Or on a piece of note paper, write down, what do you think the key words are? I don't need to check in. I don't have to have them answer it in chat, but I am gonna assume, right? Assuming best efforts that they're doing it. Then we'll show them the answer to make sure that, that we're all on the same page. Then I can start going through the paragraphs, paragraph by paragraph. Sometimes I change the order in the book. You'll notice that I have the longest one first. This is the one that I know students most often get wrong because it's such a good introduction. They miss that it's not a good introduction for a timed essay. And I put it first so that I can easily go back and forth with my question to say, no, 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 you see it's asking which effect. I'm gonna need one effect. Then we go through the other paragraphs. The other, the, the one that I've put last is the other one that I know students often get wrong because it's, it's just inverted and it has the, the topic at the end of the sentence instead of at the beginning of the sentence. And I put that at the end again so that I can easily show them, ah, oh, no, remember what our question is. I don't have to flip back through five or six slides. And where do great images come from? Here are three sources of copyright free images. The first one, ELT picks, might actually be the most useful because those are images that are, have been sourced and taken and uploaded by other English language teachers. But for the more kind of stocky photo kinds of things, you can look at Pixabay and Unsplash. Those are all free images. Uh, I wind up buying my images. It's, it's legal to take an image and use it for classroom teaching. But if you're making PDFs of your slides and those are getting posted and those are getting shared, I get a little nervous. So I, I know that I want all my images to be legal. So I either take them from a copyright free site or I purchase them. It's gonna cost you 50, 60 yen per image. Not that bad if it's something you're gonna be reusing or take some personal photos. So this is a, an, an example of a, a two page spread higher level material. There's information on a, a student organization that runs global internships called ASEC. Uh, our topic is cultural differences. Then there's a blog entry of some student who's had a, a, a cultural misunderstanding in Cameroon and how he worked through it and what he could have done instead. Because I wrote this, when I teach it online or, or in person, I share the pictures of the case that it's based on, which would be that, that, that young white man in the, in the front row in the middle, that's my son. And he was the one who had the cultural misunderstanding and uh, eventually climbed Mount Cameroon with his friends. And I, I use those images to elicit ideas or I show the images as I read from the textbook, something like that. Obviously, if you didn't write the textbook, you don't have the same images that go with exactly that page. But I think students respond very well to something that's clearly not a stock photo. So if you had a similar experience to the one described in the textbook, you can do 
as an ad addition, a sort of parallel lesson. And my only caveat then would be, if you're going to tell a personal story, make sure that you also take the time to put some exercises in with it. Because if it's just the teacher waffling on, that's not really of any use to anybody. But if you also have some ideas for people to listen to or some vocabulary or, or a writing assignment from it or discussion questions from it, then there's a point for them to listen to your story and you get that added advantage of having what's clearly a real photo. Because I want students, when they look at pages like these, I want them to know that it's, it's real material. That's the English that people use. Those are the concepts that university students need. And you know, it's not just something materials writers pulled out of their behind somewhere, that we, we do base our materials in reality. So here's a, a, a brief, Summary of the points, I mean, 10 minutes isn't a lot of time and I've probably gone over it anyway. Um, of the, the points that I made, I, I think my, my two main messages that I'd like to get across are to take, take your information and break it into smaller chunks. Go bit by bit and then add images, especially with, with online stuff, too much text, as, as you know, gets overwhelming. The more images you can speak to that will support your presentations, the easier it's gonna be for students to follow. Yeah, let me throw in the third most important one, which is to give students time to think before asking for a response. So you can ask a question and you can wait a minute or two. And if nothing happens in the chat, you can wait another minute just to give them some thinking time before you call on people or ask again or something so that they have a chance to feel that they are actively participating. And thank you very much for listening. I am gonna send um, a PDF of the slides to Jose, but you can also contact me directly if you would like to find them that way. And thank you so much for, for ha having me. I'm going to stop the screen share now. Okay, and thank you, Dorothy. And I'll turn this back on so I can wave and say hi or bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can we go now to Alistair, um, who I can't see right now, I'm Alistair here. Graham Marr. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, who is uh, both an author and a publisher with Abex, and uh, who's going to introduce his topic. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. All right. So Basically, uh, I mean, it's an interesting situation because um, I've been struggling and uh, just doing as I can sort of thing. So I don't know if everything that I'm going to say comes from great success, but it's me waffling through. But basically, my situation is that I'm doing seminar classes with smaller groups of students synchronously uh, using Zoom and larger classes um, asynchronously using um, worksheets, Microsoft Word, based on the textbook. So students are listening to the lectures and, and these sorts of things, and then filling in the answers that ordinarily I'd be doing orally. They're doing them in a, in a written style. And then I'm using the publishers, which is, yes, my stuff, I guess, Abex's stuff, although designed by Paul Rain, I should say. Um, with video, speaking, voice recognition, and so on. Now, what I was thinking about is the, how to do the, the breakout rooms well. And one of the things that I do a lot is, is literature circles, where you're having students listen to a lecture uh, and then summarize it. And one of the great things I think for teaching is, is task repetition that if we just have a student summarize at one time, it's not good enough. Uh, I think the learning really comes from task repetition. So you want them to do it two or three times. And a great vehicle for that is um, literature circles. But what you need to do is move students around. So after each task repetition, that the students are talking with a new novel group of students. You can't just say, hey, that was great, do it again, right? Uh, so if you have them in a completely new group, it gives it communicative purpose. But how do you do that quickly in Zoom? So actually yesterday I turned into Steve Hanaberry's talk and, um, and I talked a little bit about this, but basically, uh, I'm creating all the, uh, I should go back and say that next term, I'm going to be doing uh, a little bit more Zoom with my big, huge classes. So 
what you can do is have the students rename themselves. And so, and it's actually sort of good, what can I say, TPR style teaching, do this, do this, do this. But when they come in, um, often their name will be in Japanese. So you say, okay, I want you to be 01 Hamada Taro or, or what have you. And so each student has his own number. And then that allows for uh, easier uh, second sessions of the Zoom and third sessions of the Zoom or rather of the, the lit circles. Um, I have talked with a, a colleague of mine who is doing all of his classes synchronously, and he says this system works. Trouble is that you do have to have this Excel sheet of all these different student numbers so you get that the numbers um, exactly spot on. And this was from uh, Steve Henneberry's presentation yesterday, where um, you, you give it group one, you Taro Hamada, and then group leader. Uh, and so you assign it, uh, and so you can control it through, um, what can I say, a code system. Uh, I, I'm just using straight old numbers. Uh, you can also use uh, a code system. Now, I can't say that this is gonna work great. It works well with the seminar classes. And one of the things I find is that in a face-to-face -face situation, a lit circles run through would take about five minutes. I find online, it takes about eight minutes, just people talking over each other, the mic not hearing well and things like that. It seems to take not double, but certainly a lot longer than face to face. So that's just my experience, but I welcome comments. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about was assessment. And because you can't test the students, because even if you're using, you know, Google Forms or what have you, you don't know that there's a ringer sitting offline, right? Um, I know that now TOEFL have a new online basis where you, you, you have to turn your camera around and that sort of thing. But we found that at our school, having, you know, a high stakes exam online is just not feasible. So what we're doing is assessing the process. Now, up to now, I've always taught the process. So for example, the process of going to summarize a lecture, um, so students listen, fill in the missing information, and then they prepare notes. So what I have my students do is take pictures of it. So take out their, 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 their cell phones, take pictures, take pictures. So every week they upload the uh, Microsoft Word worksheet, plus usually three or four uh, pictures and I just confirm that they're doing it, you know, that they're taking the notes and things like that. So this is the process of getting to towards a summary. If it was an integrated activity, which is like the TOEFL style, they listen to a lecture, sorry, they read an article, take notes, listen to the lecture, take notes, and then they take notes on how to compare. Uh, in this case, it, it's a cast doubt uh, relationships. So again, taking the pictures. And that way I can see that at least they're going through uh, the process. Now, one of the uh, questions I actually asked to OTJ website the other day was, like, what have you learned from your online that you're going to take back with you to your face-to-face uh, -face classes? And I think a little bit more assessment of the process. I've been teaching the process and assessing the product for like 30 years. And so this year, I'm now teaching the process and assessing the process as well as a little product. So I think I'm going to actually take that into my next iteration of teaching. Lastly, uh, I, don't, I haven't been watching my time, by the way. I hope I'm okay. Um, lastly, I've been very curious about the results. Like, uh, are my students happy with worksheets? Would they like to do more Zoom and things? And our school has fielded a few complaints or feedback from students saying they want more interactivity. And so I did some Google form questionnaires. And this was my most positive group for more interactivity. 45.8% said that they would like to have more Zoom classes. 50% said that they'd like to keep with the worksheets. And in another class, believe it or not, it was 85%. And the reason is, is that lower what can I say, lower proficiency learners have a better chance of getting an A. One of the things I'm finding and a problem I'm having is that I'm having a lot of A's this year because through the worksheets, a really good student will do the worksheet in 40 minutes. The student with not so strong English will do the worksheet in 90 minutes, but the product 
is the same. And so um, at any rate, it's a bit interesting that I was wondering what your experiences are as well. What I've come around to the idea is that, okay, I might do 20 minute classes. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you. And in something that never happens is an author went under time. Oh, was that how much you was still, that? You've you still got two, two and a half minutes left. But well, if I have two and a half minutes left, because I, I forgot, I was going to turn on my phone, and of course, I, I forgot. I was just going to ask everyone, are, is anyone doing breakout rooms where they're moving groups around after, say, eight minutes or what have you, and doing it successfully, and how are you doing it? Jose. Yeah. Marcos. Which one? Jose first, and okay. then Marcos. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, the comment I was going to make was, uh, I, I think a lot of people were probably finding, like I was early, that if I wasn't feeling that there was success, it was because the breakout rooms themselves were not properly randomizing. And this was an issue that um, I was getting for the first couple of weeks and uh, until I thought of a different way to do it. And if I can share my screen, I can show, if, Mark, may I? Sure. Okay. Um, Am I the host now? No, but everyone can see my screen, yeah? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ooh, oh, uh, can someone let that, uh, yep. one of the co -hosts? thank you. I did. Okay, so on my screen are my breakout rooms. Oh, that's right. I've, I've already set up the breakout rooms for Mark. Okay, so I'm only going to describe it. I can't actually do it because um, uh, I, I have these rooms very gingerly set. You go to a breakout room and you do it once and it'll be random. Okay, but if you want to do it again, okay, and they're already in the conference, you have to hit the recreate button. I'm pretty sure everybody knows the recreate yeah. button. Yeah. Okay, actually, I don't need to uh, share my screen at this point. One of, one of the problems, Jose, just to quickly throw in here, is that when there's groups of four, there's different roles. There's leader, summarizer, detailed vocabulary. Ah, for lit circles, my bad. And they keep their role through the whole time. So I have to create new groups, yet maintain their role. So just okay, doing it straight. Tough, then. Yeah, that's why I'm using that number system. If it was just like um, random, 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 that's no problem. Okay. But I, I want to, the leader has to be the leader continuously through that class. Okay, then my, my solution isn't going to apply. I wasn't thinking of that at all. All right. Well, if anyone wants my Excel sheet, you're welcome to it. Um, Marcos, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I've got a, a, something I do that's similar. It's uh, for poster presentations. Um, so they also have to keep their roles while, while rotating through the class. Um, and my solution was to, to make a diagram. I, I, I was feverishly trying to find it here to show you. Uh, I'll show you some other time. But I, bas I basically created a, a diagram of how the rotation is going to work. And I showed that to the students beforehand. Um, I had them number themselves much like you did. So I could tell easily who's in which group. And then uh, I put them into breakout rooms. And I was outside of the breakout room with a timer. And then when the timer ran out, I would just reassign them to rooms. Um, and it was a bit of a clunky process, but it worked well. Uh, the only problem was that I didn't, myself didn't have an opportunity to, to go into any of the breakout rooms during the process. So what I also had to do is to have the students record their sessions. And then I had to view them later for assessment. Um, so it's a bit of a complicated process, but it worked really well. And I'll share it with you, maybe, yeah. or, or anyone else who might be interested. Yeah, I kind of think it has to be that sort of numeric system. But maybe yeah. I've done it with small groups. If we have another meeting in December, I'll tell you how it went with the big groups. Okay. Jose? Um, I'm still hypothesizing on this because it hasn't been implemented, and I'm still not going to share it it's going to work. But in this situation, I was thinking about this for a different situation, but it might also work. Teaming up Zoom with students who have a Facebook account and are in a group uh, that you have made as, as the administrator of the group. There's a new feature in Facebook called Rooms where you basically do a live stream from your camera and then you invite other people to join you in that specific room. If they are not invited to that room, they cannot uh, go, they cannot hear or do anything else in anybody's room. And the nice thing about modern computers is that unlike old computers, where only one, com one piece of software could use the camera and the microphone at a time, modern computers can actually 
distribute the same camera signal to almost any, uh, depending on your RAM and your processor power, to almost any software at the same time. So you can have somebody running Zoom at the same time they're running Facebook. Now, this is only a theory, but the idea is that the kids would stay in the Zoom conference, okay, and then you tell them, okay, everybody make your rooms, and then while in the conference, you're managing who's going to be what and tell, still telling them their number while they're in the conference. Then they themselves are taught how to do their Facebook team while they stay in the conference at the same time. They do their work in the team room, get it done, come back to the conference. Still very much a theory, but something but that I'm thinking. An idea of using okay. a second system. All right, thank you very much. I yield my time back to you, thank you. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, great. Um, Anyway, thanks so much, Alistair. Um, uh, and now the next part, something that we thought is a little bit different is, uh, for those of you who can see my picture, a few months ago, it was like we were all given a rose and we grabbed it by the stem, which means the thorns. And so what we wanna do is introduce an activity called Thorns and Roses. Um, and let me share a, slide for that. Uh, okay, and hi. Uh, so the question is, when you started teaching online, uh, what was challenging? What is still challenging? And what bloomed? What are the roses? What, what are the good things that came out of this? Most teachers who I've talked to, um, a lot of us are really looking forward to getting back to face to face, but, but almost everybody I know is saying, yeah, but I'm gonna keep X, whatever, you know, something that you've developed over, over time. And so what we'd like to do is, is break our group into, there are 36 people, 37 people here, so break us into groups of about six or seven people. And each, each person, please take about two minutes to talk about your thorns and your roses. Okay, we'll have to be fairly self-disciplined about this because we only have 15 minutes for the whole activity. There should be at least one author in um, each of the rooms. Authors, can I ask you to go last? Okay, not not first, because you're, you're just to kind of helping facilitate. Okay, does everybody get what we're doing? So I, I'd encourage you to turn on your microphone, turn on your uh, camera, and uh, Jose, can we go to the breakout room? Oh, it's back, it's, I've been warped. It's lovely to see you, Curtis. And it's lovely to see you, Melody. Everybody, Melody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, it was uh, kind of funny yesterday when they brought me back from the uh, operation and I was coming out of the anesthetic and I was like really groggy. And Tatsura and I were trying to have a conversation and I was just, I'd, I'd like fall asleep in the middle of words. <laughs> Mark, you're still muted, eh? Yeah. Uh, David Chapman, can I, can I ask you to share, for just to get us started again, can I ask you to share that, uh, that last rose that you mentioned? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest and the best roses of this is, is this group, I mean, this whole group. I mean, I'm active in JALT. I, see, you know, I try and get to the local meetings and stuff like that, too, but it's not, not nearly this much interaction. You know, really honestly, not nearly this much interaction. So yeah, OTJ is wonderful. And like, we've all been online way too much this semester and now we have a week off. And so like, let's go. <laughs> let's Which be is, online some more. Excuse me, who has a week off? I, I'm yeah, next. That's true. Okay, let's jump back. And we have, we have, to go. Uh, one, two, three, four. Good night, Dorothy. Okay, Dorothy. Lovely to see you. Take care, Dorothy, good to see you. Yeah, see you, Dorothy. Okay, we, we have four you. more author presentations and then we'll um, just throw it open to free discussion if that's okay. And, and 
if you don't mind, I will go next. So I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Um, which has somehow moved. Here we go. And that was a first slide. This is, um, okay, I need to start my timer so I know how much time I have. Hi. Uh, learning from home. This is, this is the page I made for my students to you know, collect all the assignments. And, and what I was trying to think about is um, trying to create student to student connections in my own um, teaching background here in my, my own teaching and writing. I'm very influenced by positive psychology and in positive psychology currently and, and um, well being in general, currently one of the most important um, models is from um, Marty Seligman uh, called PERMA. And PERMA stands for Positive Emotion, Engagement, Relationships, Meaning, and Accomplishment. And these are all really, really important. But last, you know, March, April, when I was planning, you know, what are we going to do? What I, what I was really concerned about is relationships. How are we going to create the classroom culture that makes a, a class, especially a communication class, work. And um, so I knew I wanted to start a, well, what I didn't know at that time, and but somebody taught me early on was Flipgrid, which I absolutely love. This is one of those things that I'm gonna keep using after all this stuff is over. Um, and Flipgrid, for those of you who don't know, allows the students to make short videos and allows them to respond to each other's videos. And um, so um, for the, the first assignment, which is kind of obvious because this is what we do in, in many classes, is a self-introduction. But I told the students what I don't want them to do is I'm so-and-so and I'm 18 years old and I'm from Sendai and I like K-pop because that's like true about everybody or most people. So I said, self-introduction, what is something um, that uh, about you that isn't true about everyone else? And um, I was very fortunate that one of my first students um, sent in what I thought was a brilliant example of something that was true about her, but not everybody else. And this is Rikako. Hi everyone, I'm Rikako Watanabe, nice to meet you. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm from Sendai. I'm in second grader. My hobby is dyeing my hair. The color that I had dyed green, orange, yellow, blue, pink and more. Next color, I'm not decided yet. So if you know good color, please tell me. Hey, and Mel, you just gave, gave her a thumbs up and that was my reaction. I, I, I told her that was brilliant. By the way, all the students I'm gonna show you have, have given me permission to use these. But I thought that is brilliant because it's true about her and you're gonna remember it. Yeah. And it's true about probably nobody else. Yeah. So it gave an excellent example of something that's unique. Okay, and then I asked them all to respond to each other's videos, which Flipgrid makes it very easy to do. And so, and they get points for this. This is part of the, the grading. But uh, here is Minami, who is a dancer. I often dance at my home. I especially like cross dance. Do you know cross dance? Okay. I will show you it now. <laughs> and that is floss dance, by the way, F-L-O-S-S. -S. Hi, Minami. Your dance is so funny. I like it. I, uh, these days, I try to practice K-pop music, K-pop, but I can't. It's very difficult for me. Right. Okay, what's she doing in her response? We're establishing commonality. We both like music. Hi, Minami. 
I'm Ayaka. Your dance is great. Please tell me how to the dance. Okay, and you can see under the picture. I'm looking forward to see you. Take care. Bye. You can see under the picture that like four different students responded to her, and that I think helped build that connection. It helped them get to know each Mark, other. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when, because I use Flipgrid as well a lot. Um, when you have students respond to each other's videos, do you require that every student responds to every other student's video? How no, 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 I don't think that would be practical. No, so how, what do you do with that? Okay, yeah, great question, thank you. Um, I say you got to respond to at least three, three students. Okay. Yeah. And I say, and watch, I mean, I'm disappointed. Flipgrid just changed the format. They used to have that little circle right under the picture. Now yeah. they just, they're in a line, so it's not easy to see how many uh, responses uh, an individual has. What I liked about the circles is I, I could say, look, if somebody's already got five responses, respond to somebody else. Make sure everybody gets responses. So it kind of built, again, I think that helped make us a, a group. Yeah, because that, that's what I do. I tell them, you know, when you respond, you are not allowed to respond to somebody's video who already has more than three other responses. Okay. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. smart. So, so then, then it gets evened out automatically. Right. So I think that that that's worked well in my class. Okay. Yeah. I do allow more than three responses, and they get points. Well, it depends on how many students you've got in your class, obviously. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Next one. I need. I need to keep moving. Um, then how am I going to pull them together? Well, unit one in most conversation books is introductions. So that was a no brainer. In this, they're using um, first hand success. This is a, a fairly low level uh, class of non majors. Um, unit two is about clothing and fashion and a lot of descriptive adjectives and stuff like that. So we decided to do a fashion show. Um, I asked them to wear something they like, it doesn't have to be fancy. And then we spent a, a class doing stuff similar to what we were talking about with, you know, repeating, uh, using breakout rooms, kind of like the 432 model where you're doing the same presentation, same mini speech over and over. I gave them a model of talking about clothes in the third person. And I gave them something a little weird to kind of hopefully give them some freedom. Mark is wearing it. A midnight black shirt and pants, and a bold silver belt. His necktie is black with bright pink, and it has rhinestones, so when the light hits it, it sparkles. And when he puts on his special black jacket, It has sequins, and so when the light catches it, he's like a walking disco ball. Okay, so I wanted to be a little off the wall to give the students freedom. Hello everyone. Yuna is wearing a white t-shirt and a base tight skirt. There are two points in her outfit. The first one is the lace on the sleeves. It's so cute. The second one is a leopard belt. She likes simple and casual clothes. I'm going out because I'm dressed up. Let's go. Okay, I'm going to skip this one just yeah. for time. Yeah, I like sporty fashion. It's so comfortable and cool. Okay, I wish she was louder. She says she likes sporty fashion. She is a health education major, which means she's going to be a PE teacher. Sporty fashion. It's already summer. I want to go to. 
So I was getting a little worried here when she said if she's going to the pool, what's she going to put on next? This is so cute. Oh, awesome. Oh, hilarious. Yeah, probably someone's sleeping. She's doing it at midnight. <laughs> yep. Sleeping or yeah. doesn't matter, little brother to hear and heckle her. Yeah. You just said, is this also sporty fashion? Yes, it is. Let's, 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 let's swing. <laughs> okay. Now, what's fun is notice the, the, Peer responses. My favorite DUR video is Gogu. I'm looking forward to wearing it at school someday. It's oh. all swimming together. I mean, isn't that a great you can <laughs> see you can see how these kids are bonding. It, yeah. They are connecting as a group. Something that's interesting about this particular class is it's made up of students. For, it's a required class, first year. Okay, so yeah. the students don't know each other yet from three different majors. And usually students don't even talk to students from other majors. Right. And they're just totally connected. And after I saw the success of that, I went back and, and I wrote um, project work activities for initially for the first six units of every book and then because so many places are still online for all 12 units it and i i i used my textbook series obviously but i put in the language function and the grammar points so if you're teaching some other book you know most elementary most textbooks at a given level teach similar language points go to this uh link and you can download them all and it's it's project work ideas using Flipgrid. Um, so that's uh, um, what I was doing. This particular class, I, I found it interesting. Um, Flipgrid gives you, gives you statistics, 279 hours. And there are 33 students in the class, plus me, I kind of was one of the things. That comes to 8.2 hours per student of communication work, listening and speaking outside, which is like having an extra five coma during the semester. So I thought it was wonderful. Um, and last thing, this particular class ends at noon. I don't have another class until one o'clock. I just leave the meeting on, turn off my camera and uh, microphone, go eat lunch. And they continued talking up until I come back 45 minutes later and I have to kick them off. And that is a kind of bonding that you rarely see. Anyway, um, I will mention the, the uh, Jolt Mind Brain Education uh, SIG uh, did a special issue of our Think Tank magazine. Um, go to this and you can uh, download it free. I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. I'll put it in the chat, the issue. Okay, great. Please do. Please do. Okay. And uh, next up is Marcos Benavides. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and then show you some stuff that I've been doing on uh, Moodle. And let's begin with the teacher's view here. Um, so what you are looking at is a Moodle that I'm setting up for um, a course that I'm trying to adapt to Moodle. So I, I've got my, um, my, my textbook, which is a task-based text, te uh, textbook, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it. And it's very tricky, um, number one, to have a task-based textbook in the first place. Um, Curtis will know, he's, he's another uh, TBLT uh, textbook writer here today. Um, and one of the problems is assessment. Um, and so one of the things, uh, and, and the process um, is very important of uh, performing a task, getting feedback, and then performing a task once again. This, this process is central to, to TBLT. Um, and Moodle isn't really set up for that. 
And so in some ways, you, you kind of have to hack the system a little bit. So what I'm going to show you uh, here today is uh, two, two sort of solutions that I came up with. One of them is using the workshop module on Moodle. Um, and the other one is a kind of uh, hacked version uh, of the same thing. Um, so the workshop version on Moodle, if, if those of you who have used Moodle and perhaps have tried this before, um, is a very powerful tool, but it's also um, a little bit complicated to use. So the first time you, you look at it, you, you can't quite figure out uh, how it works, perhaps. That was the case with me. Um, you get this, uh, this table, and it's actually a process where you go through uh, various stages of the task. Uh, you can see it here uh, outlined as submission phase, assessment phase, and so on. The, the advantage of it is it allows you to, to do a whole process of assessment and submission. Uh, and I'll show you what it looks like. So the, the setup phase, uh, I have set it up so that the students get a kind of description of the task that they're going to do. Uh, this, remember, this is we're looking at it from the teacher's perspective. Um, but the student's perspective, they get a, a, an example. So this is the task that I'm going to be working with now, uh, which is basically to the students have designed the, uh, a kind of a new idea for a product, a new invention. Um, and then they have to write a product proposal, uh, as you see on the right here. The left is an example from the textbook. On the right is what they're going to do. So I've set it up so that the student gets this on their kind of landing page. I'm going to switch now um, to share a screen where I've got a, a student's account set up. So that's this one here. This is what the student sees, okay? Um, and again, we're looking at this workshop one right now. So when the student clicks on the workshop, they get the same setup phase. Uh, they don't get to see all of the information that's in here. Uh, and they get the description. So it, it tells them what they are going to be doing. You're going to submit and assess the product proposal form uh, from the textbook. So they get this. Um, they can't proceed yet though, because this submission phase has to be turned on by the teacher. Um, so switching back now to the teacher view, I'm gonna be switching back and forth between these two screens today, just to show you how this works. Um, the teacher can now submit when it's time to, to perform the, the uh, task. The teacher will then switch, confirm. Now we are in the submission phase. And you can see that the information below here has, has changed. From the teacher's point of view, I'm looking at the list of students. But let's switch back again to the student's view. And from the student's perspective, and I'll have to refresh this, they are now in the submission phase. So now it's got instructions on what they need to do. They have to submit the product proposal form. Um, but before they do that, they have example submissions to assess. And this is kind of the point of this activity. I wanted them to be able to uh, look at some examples and as you can see, they, can, they have access to these examples that they can grade. If they click here, they will see uh, an example submission from a previous student, a previous year, that they can assess. Um, they can read it and then click the Assess button and they give it a score. Okay? It's set up as a kind of uh, feedback. So it's got an assessment rubric that they look at um, and then they give it a score and they can give feedback to the students here and then save. And this is here, it, this is one of the problems. This is one of the clunkiness with Moodle. Um, it doesn't let you go back from this particular screen in the workshop. Um, I'm gonna switch back now to the teacher view in Firefox. Um, and we are back now in looking at the teacher's view. Um, and from the teacher's view, you can, let me see if I refresh this, I should be able to see, here we go, that one of the students, uh, no, because we're still in the assessment stage, so nothing has changed. So now what the teacher can do, once the students have done the assess assessment, you again switch to the assessment phase where the students can submit. So from, from the workshop point, here, the student goes through, they assess 
um, three different assignments, and then they have a submission option. Here we go, where they can submit their own uh, product proposal. Okay. Um, if, if you've been having trouble following what I'm doing here, uh, this is because uh, a little bit of the clunkiness of this particular module in Moodle, and it isn't very easy to use. Um, so if you're having trouble following what I'm doing here, you're not alone. Um, I, and I wouldn't worry about it too much uh, because what I ended up doing, and again, I'm going to share back to teacher, oh, I am in teacher view now. Um, what I ended up doing is I decided not to use this workshop module. Um, I decided to actually do something different that's much simpler. I used the feedback module in Moodle. Uh, to and, and, and the assignment module on Moodle to create the same kind of task uh, in two steps. So even though it's two steps here, it's actually much simpler. Um, and not only is it simpler, it guides the student along this path where they have to do the assessment. And until they do the assessment, this is not available. Okay. Um, and it's a much simpler module. So if you're familiar with the various modules on Moodle, um, this feedback module is actually for, it's like Google Forms uh, to set up uh, surveys, that kind of thing. Um, but if you click here, you can see that this is a much cleaner uh, interface than the workshop. Uh, it's much simpler to set up. Um, it gives the instructions to the students. Oh, I've already completed the activity. Oh, right, because I'm looking at it as a teacher. Let's switch screens from the student's point of view. And you will see, here we go, and there we go. So product proposal. So here we go. They answer the questions, and it's the same kind of thing. They're looking at the product. They're grading the product. They're giving feedback and giving it a score. Next page. Now they look, they, now they get uh, an example of what the teacher graded it as with feedback so that they see what a B is, right? This is what I'm trying to kind of train the students. I, I, I'm using what, what actually is done for greater reliability, right? So when you do any kind of graded tests like the Aiken and so on, uh, before you do interview tests or any, any other kind of task-based uh, tests, you do greater reliability to make sure that all the graders are kind of on the same level. I'm, I'm doing that kind of work with the students here so that they see what the, the task requirements are and what I'm looking for. Right, so they look at a couple of different, again, a couple of different scores. This is a, uh, an example that's not all that good. I think it was a C or a D. Um, they go to the next page and again, they see what the teacher gave and the feedback that the teacher gave. Okay? It doesn't matter if their score is different. What, the important thing here is for them to think about what they gave and what the teacher gave and how these are different. As long as they're thinking about that, it'll be helpful for them when they do their own uh, assignment. So again, they do the final one, and this was the, uh, an example of the best one. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time going through it, but this one uh, was an example of an A. Uh, and again, they can go through, give feedback, and the feedback in this case, this is what an A looks like. Um, do you agree? Well, it doesn't really matter. It's just here for their own benefit. Um, but now, submit your answers. Now they go to the next uh, stage. They go back to here. And now they can submit the task, okay? Because the two tasks are connected. And so to be able to actually submit their proposal, they had to have done the previous uh, assessment activity. So now they're ready and they can upload, um, you know, click here, and then it gives them an option to upload their, their, their file. Um, and then they're done. Right. So again, just to, to, to go back and explain, I've got about 30 seconds left of my 10 minutes. Um, what, what I've done here is I've essentially uh, hacked um, the function of some of these uh, modules on Moodle uh, to basically do what I wanted to do. Uh, so I ended up using these two modules. This one is the feedback module and this one is the assignment submission module to basically do what um, other people have used the workshop module for. Now, again, let me just say the workshop model module is very powerful. It's very good. 
Um, if you know what you're doing and you're, you're prepared to follow it through, um, it'll work very well. Um, it just isn't the kind of thing, and, and this is where, you know, wearing my author's hat, it's not the kind of thing I would condone uh, using for a class, uh, giving to other teachers to use for their own class. Uh, one of the main um, sort of things to keep in mind when you're writing a textbook is it has to be usable and easily sort of intuitive, intuitively usable um, by other teachers, uh, which unfortunately this is not, uh, the, the workshop module is not, but other modules on Moodle are and, and are quite good. Um, so I, I hope that made sense to you. I've, I'm now at 10 minutes and 41 seconds, so I'm gonna stop. And I guess if, I, I guess there are no time for questions, I'm not sure, Mark, back to you. Yeah, let's go back. Let's do the other two presentations and then just general uh, questions, okay? Okay. Okay, great. So next up we have Amanda Gillis Furutake. Okay. Good. And you're ready to go? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, oh, this is not right. Uh, just a minute. <laughs> Can you can you see that one slide? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's I, not what it. That's your slide number two, I think. Can yes, you, it is. Can, yeah, press, I'm trying the, to press the back arrow. I'm trying. So I'm trying to do. It's not responding. Just a second. Um, let me just put that away. Uh, let's see if I can go to. Mm, Stop share a minute. Uh, I just um, see if I can reset it. Yeah, this it was time... working fine uh, just now, wasn't it earlier? Yeah. This oh well, time, it doesn't. Mm, yeah. When you go to PowerPoint, click. Um, start I don't have, from beginning. Or, oh, I don't this, have you know? that on my menu, so ah. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna quit PowerPoint quickly and open it again. Yeah. Good idea. Okay. That's my suggestion. Okay. Uh, sorry about this, folks. <laughs> it's okay. This is the stuff I look for in the edits to clip out. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? No, you're not. Oh. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> now everybody's wondering, what didn't we see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Damn, damn, damn. It was working just now. Um, where's my presentations folder gone? Let me just open recents. Uh -huh. Uh, Amanda, do you want us yeah. to go to Curtis and then give you a few Yeah, minutes? I'll come back. I'll sort my computer out and come back again. Is yeah. that all right? Curtis, yep. can, yep. can I shoot it over to you? Sorry about that. I guess so. I was going to go downstairs and run on another <laughs> computer, but I'm not set up yet. I saw okay, quitting I'll, PowerPoint, I'll that's why. Um, okay. So let me see. How do I get to the first slide? No, I know, I know, I know. So I have to open this up again. Share screen. By the time I get started, Amanda will be ready. Okay. So I guess I'm unmuted, right? You can hear me okay? Yeah. So I'm going to talk more about the social brain than the business simulation uh, because that's something that's really interesting in relation to online teaching. And probably all of you have experienced Zoom fatigue, but why? Go ahead and type some possible reasons you think you've added into the uh, chat, but I'll get back to this after I talk a little bit more about the social brain. Now, the social brain has been pretty much explained to all of us by Matthew Lieberman. And he's got some great TED Talks, The Social Brain and Superpowers. And there's another one uh, the social brain in the classroom that we featured, we are featuring in our September 1st issue of the Think Tank, 
which Mark has contributed to. So you want to look at that. I'll put that in the chat later if you want to download it. But basically, Lieberman found this. We've known for about 20 years we have this default mode network in our brain. It's the part of our brain that becomes active when you're not using it for anything else. It's the part we call daydreaming, mentalizing. We start kind of going through little scenarios in our heads. When you're listening to a boring presentation, like maybe this one right now, you're starting to your mentalizing network is taking over. But he found it's almost exactly the same as the social brain, which is there on the right. So really, our default mode is our social brain, he suggests. And that's where we do mentalizing, figuring out the thoughts, moods, and intentions of others. It's the part of our brain that does the mind reading, and it's so important, and it's active almost all the time, and it's really what he calls our superpower. And we do this by watching little signals and gestures and, and listening to voice and intonations from people. Like, look at this. Here's two pictures of the same guy smiling. Can you see a difference? Somebody just turn on your mic and say something. The eyes. Eyes and how, yes. what, how does this look to you in terms of sincerity? I know I was less sincere. Yeah, what that's what exactly it. This is an example of a real smile versus a fake smile. And because we're so tuned into people all the time, watching their reactions, even just a little difference like that becomes noticeable to us. And so that shows how powerful our social brain is running in the background all the time. Here's a couple other celebrities. Which one's the fake smile? You can just point with your finger. Or I think you already know. Because the three characteristics of a snake's fake smile are eyes not closed, no crow's feet, visible bottom teeth. So how does that, so what happens when we're using Zoom? We have these pixelated pictures of people and shadows. Their reactions are delayed by a second or two because of the speed of electricity. And it's really taxing on our brain. And people aren't looking at us. So all the things that our brain are doing all the time, suddenly everything's been changed and it's overtaxing our brains. Like here's my class. And I'm always wondering then, how is Zoom going to affect our subjective evaluations? Like look at these three folks. Here's this guy down here. I can only see the top of his head the whole semester. When it comes to grading time, since he never smiled at me or reacted to things I said that I could see, am I going to give him a lower grade? Or this guy who's all fuzzy. It looks like he's got this bad attitude, but really he's looking at his cell phone where the textbook is. Or how about this person with uh, high res or you know broadband and she's dressing up and things. Am I going to give her a higher grade? I did. <laughs> but that shows some of the problems of the superpower when we're going online. And it is our superpower. That's what Lieberman calls it. Because primates, other primates can't do this. If you want to talk about what makes people different from other creatures, it's the social brain. Even the most advanced apes only get up to the age of a, uh, the, the mind reading power of a three year old. We go well beyond that. So they can only exist in groups of 20 or 30 or maybe 50, whereas we have almost no limit to the number of people we can work with. And even people that are a thousand miles away, our mentalizing network is watching. Is this guy sincere? How do they feel about each other? We're doing that all the time, seeing people thousands of miles away on television. So this is our superpower, the social brain. But, as Lieberman says, it has a kryptonite too. And the kryptonite is education. See, the problem is we have this really powerful social part of our brain that's paying attention to other people and motivating us and doing things. We also have this analytical brain the part that we use, the working memory area, the thing that we use for analysis. And what do teachers teach to? The analytical thinking brain. Memorize this, read this, do this exercise, fill this in, learn this for the test. And so we're not really taking advantage of the social brain enough. 
that's true for most courses except yours because your language teachers you already know the importance of the social brain and of course language is a, a, a side product of the social brain so you're already using it but the thing is that the social brain and the analytical brain cannot be in operation at the same time very easily it's like a seesaw when one's active the other disappears and vice versa and which is the heavier of the two? Well, how many times have you been reading something in a newspaper and thought, oh my God, I got to tell this to Mark Helgeson. That's your social brain suddenly gets active when you have feelings like that. But the important thing is both of these are related to learning. And we tend to not take enough advantage of the social part. Well, here's an interesting study. Um, some two groups of students were told to read something and one group was told you're going to be tested on it. The other group was told you have to teach it to somebody else, which, and, but both groups were given the test. Which group do you think got the higher score? Of course, the ones that learned it to teach it to somebody else had more incentive to really learn it than to just pass the test, which is kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? If you think about your best learning experiences, they're probably working with a group, discussing a problem, trying to make something with another group of people, and yet we're losing this in education. Most emergency remote teaching at my school, at least, is like this. I asked my graduate students, how many of your professors are using Zoom lectures or Zoom? They said, all nine. Oh, that's fantastic. How many are using breakout rooms? Just you, Mr. Kelly. So they're just using Zoom as a lecture platform. Or they're putting videos on YouTube to watch that one student writes a report to. Or putting readings in the LMS that people have to do in homework exercise for. Well, Lieberman would say, why not give them two readings to half the students one reading, half the students another, and have them teach each other as the asynchronous activity? Yeah, so there's ways we can still do this we can fix this problem but the real problem is that we still most people still think of education as being teachers putting information into young people's minds kryptonite but in our profession we know the social factor is so important like mark was talking about what dorothy was talking about like everybody was talking about and the education is more like this but we've lost a lot of it in this period because our main concern is how to get materials and assessments online. But we can do better. And one of my classes, not all my classes worked, but one of my classes worked really well because it was set up to use the social brain before I even knew Lieberman's studies. I have this course which is, I use this textbook that I've been working on since 1988 called Tour Designer. And actually, I started working on this long before some other grades. Oops. But the grades are widgets. Widgets was really a breakthrough in both terms of what people would publish and the kind of textbook that came out. This is a big inspiration for me. I had been working on this tour course for a long time. But I think it was widgets that really influenced me to making it into a textbook, to make it into a whole course. And Tim Craig, who's actually a business professor at University of Victoria, also used widgets, and he sort of made a version that was oriented towards higher level students that was actually teaching business concepts too. And so both of those were influences on this textbook too, written by me. Okay. So what is it? In the course, we are a tour company. I'm President Kelly of Kelly Travel Incorporated. Students are put into groups of four. Each group designs a tour to a foreign city. So each of the students are doing a different a tour to a different city. So what's different about that? Not much, is it? Here's the kicker. Each member of the group has a different role and different homework assignments. I don't assign homework to everybody to do, except at the very beginning. So in the group, there's a project manager whose job is to send a report to President Kelly every week and 
make sure everybody knows the assignments. There's the researcher who does the market research. There's the sales director who puts together the travel plan, of course, using all the members. And the graphic designer who does all the graphic work for the course. And they can't succeed in this project unless all of them collaborate. Well, once in a while you get somebody that doesn't, but there's ways that I can kind of intervene and help them out with that. So the first thing they do is make choose a city and they make guidebooks to the city. And the graphic designer's job is to make all the pages unilateral throughout the guidebook, even though the parts are written by different students. Make posters. And the final activity is to have a, a tour fair where they sell their tours to other students. They have itineraries. They have to do internet research to find out the real pricing for the tour. They have to have advertisements, things like that. But can you see how having students work together where they depend on each other's work to succeed is really activating the social brain. And of course, I put them in breakout rooms in almost every class where they'd be talking to their other group members, the same groups the entire semester. And that's where something too, having random groups every week, yeah, they get to meet more people that way, but then having the same group every week, there's some advantages to that as well. Well, when I did this live, we had poster sessions and trade fairs in the classroom. But I found that this transferred fairly easily to breakout rooms. And at Mark's advice, I kept the Zoom on at lunchtime so the students could stay together. But then I developed an even better technique for my 25 students. I would put them in the breakout rooms at the end of class and say goodbye and say, do you have any more comments for each other? I'm going to leave the class. We're finished now. I'm going to please end in the breakout rooms and you can sign out from there. Or you can stay and talk. And I had groups of four that would stay for two up to two hours after class time, you know, talking together. Okay, so I didn't talk much about the business simulation, but I will put my materials in the chat along with the um, Oh, something else I said I was going to put in chat. What was that? Oh, yes, I'll put those in the chat, and that's the end of the presentation. Great. Thanks, Curtis. Um, okay, and now can we go back to Amanda? Yes, and uh, I fixed the, <clears throat> fixed the problem. I think it's working. Okay. Great. <clears throat> I think it's this one. Okay. Can you see my screen? It's okay. Yes, okay. yes. Right, okay. So um, I feel a little bit like a cuckoo in the nest in this presentation series because I'm not a published author, but I write all my class materials for the lecture classes I teach, um, for the content courses I teach, and for my seminar. And today I'm going to talk about one of the lecture classes, which um, I has since 20, I've been teaching this since 2014. And the title of the lecture course is um, Culture and Literature of English Speaking Areas. And so I've been teaching about the music of the Beatles. And they have 15 weeks based on the, the history, the development um, and the, of the Beatles music, the Beatles as a group, the Beatles music, from the earliest days to the present day. Um, the original lecture wasn't going terribly well, and that's all explained in um, an article that was published from the proceedings of the last JALT. And um, I have a handout which I sent to Jose, which um, I hope will be available to you, which has got the link um, for that. Um, I adapted it from a more traditional teacher upfront lecturing style um, to an active learning learner centered style and I made quite a lot of my uh, lecture material into videos which were delivered to the students um, as homework and we have um, the Moodle system as our learning management system and students could access the uh, lectures and uh, do the follow-up activities to prepare for the next lesson. 
this was all going really well and um, the students in class were working in groups and um, they seemed to be getting quite a lot out of it and I was very happy that the, um, there was a lot of active learning going on and it was far more student centred. But there was a problem with the group work and the main problem was, uh, let me just, oh, oh bother this slide thing's not working now, ah okay, okay. Um, the main problem was that the older students were not taking the responsibility seriously. They were not doing the homework, they knew the system, they felt that they could just turn up to class and their mere presence in the classroom would get them a pass grade. Um, the second year students were at the end of the course very upset because they felt that they had been doing so much more um, of the work in the groups than their seniors and they just didn't feel that this was worth it. Um, so I was planning to do a lot of classroom research this semester that's just gone to find out more about group work and how to go about it in a better way. But of course, COVID-19 struck and my university took a very conservative approach. Um, they said that they didn't want the big lecture classes to be taught synchronously. They wanted it, them to be taught asynchronously and that we had to use the Moodle system. Well, that's no problem to deliver our course materials and that they didn't want um, us to use Zoom. They wanted us to use Teams um, if we were to meet with the students and Personally, I find Teams incredibly clunky to use and it's really difficult to set up breakup rooms. Anyway, what I decided to do was um, to adapt my materials and the way that I would take attendance each week would be providing a worksheet. Um, but I'm very aware of the things that Curtis has just been talking about a lot of the issues that are related to the social brain. And so um, I wanted to make worksheets that would have a very personal element for the studio students. Um, I was lucky in that for the course content part, um, I already had half a semester of lectures made on video already. Um, because they, I had seven lectures that had been made over the previous two years. And so they were able to get the course content from watching me giving lectures with PowerPoint slides. And the lectures that I didn't have ready made, I did audio commentaries for my PowerPoint slides. And then I used the worksheets. And I was determined that every week, they would be doing a very different kind of activity. Well, the materials were going to be different because they were going to be different, listening to different Beatles albums as we progressed through the semester and through the development of the Beatles music. And um, on my handout, I've given you more information, but let me just run through verbally what kind of activities I assigned for um, these four particular uh, classwork activities. Um, so at the beginning of the course, week three, the Be they, they were listening to the Beatles' first album, Please Please Me. Um, there are 14 tracks on the album. Not all of them are by the Beatles, and they were still covering some songs. And what I wanted to teach them was how to really listen to the music and to evaluate what should they be listening for. And so I gave them instructions on the worksheet about what to listen out for. First of all, when you listen to each track, pay attention as to who wrote the song and whose voice um, you are hearing singing as the lead singer or singers. And think about what you liked about the track, what you didn't like about the track. Was it the melody? Was it the lyrics? Was it the rhythm? Was it the beat? Was it the instruments that you could hear? Was it the voices? Was it the harmonies? Um, what things did you like? And so they had all of these things to listen out for and to make notes about. 
And so the part one, they listened to the 14 tracks and then part two, I wanted them to put them in order of preference, which did they like first and why? Um, which they like second, third, fourth. And then on their worksheet, they had to turn that into me and explain why they had ordered these songs in that order. So it was introducing a personal response element. And the nice thing about Moodle is that there is this feedback system. And so I could write a comment back to each student. And so it became very personal between them and me. Um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Um, this was when they were beginning to get very experimental. They got into the studio. And so I asked just three questions this time. They had to listen to the whole, whole album, but then they had to think about which tracks on the album did not sound like pop songs and why. So on this album, there is a huge range of styles of song. So that was interesting because then they had to think about, well, for me, what is a pop song anyway? And by this time, they'd been listening to quite a few of the Beatles songs. And so they were getting an idea about pop and rock. And I got some very interesting feedback about that. And the second question was, are there any songs about love? Um, are they about teenage love or some other kinds of love? And so one of the tracks on Sgt. Pepper is called When I'm 64. And uh, so that was quite interesting, their response to that song. And the third question was, uh, which songs sound like no other Beatles songs that you have heard so far in this course? And so that encouraged them to go back and sort of review the albums that they'd listened to already. Um, then we went on to Abbey Road. And uh, I also was very determined to mix and match. I didn't want them to have to write something every week. Um, also, because I'm part of the Brain Sig, we're very aware that different learners have different, they're very neurodiverse, and some do not enjoy writing so much or find it far more challenging. And so for this activity, um, they had to listen to the album. And then they had to choose their two favorite tracks and they had to identify two tracks they thought that I, Amanda, like best on this album. And that was really fun because I asked them to make a video recording on their phone. And I didn't use Flipgrid because the university had been quite strict, sort of said, don't start introducing new software, use what we've got. Next year, if we're online still, I'll be certainly using Flipgrid because that was what was missing. They were talking to me and I was responding to them, but they weren't talking to each other. But that homework, I was amazed that they talked with such confidence by this stage. They were so fluent and they could talk about the music so well because they had so much practice in the preceding weeks about describing what they were hearing and thinking about why they liked or didn't like what they were hearing. And uh, anyway, it was quite fun to hear what they thought I liked the best. Yeah, only a few actually got it right. Um, but that wasn't the whole purpose of the exercise. Um, the final activity was uh, watching, we watched uh, sections from the Beatles movie, Let It Be, and they listened to the album. And the final activity was then to think about the title of the song, Let It Be, and the film, Let It Be, and think about what this actually means. Um, then we also looked at the lyrics of Let It Be, and I asked them to explain their own understanding of this title, Let It Be, in English, and then give their own Japanese translation. Now some of the students were Chinese and they really tried very hard and they did a great job of coming up with a Japanese translation but what was fascinating was that I had almost no two translations the same and every student was able to justify the way they had translated let it be um, very articulately and so that was really very very satisfying for me. 
Um, so to sum up, the key ingredients were using worksheets, but a variety of activity types. They didn't have to write something every time. They could make a video and send that to me, upload that to me. And personal responses um, worked really well with this course. So I think I'm surely out of time. So I'll, I'll say that's it. Um, if we have any time for questions, we'll go with questions. Okay, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, everybody. It is, um, okay, a couple quick things. Amanda and Curtis, you're doing Kyoto Jolt, is it this weekend? Yes, Saturday. Two days from now, yes. Yeah. Um, and I just happened to have the URL that Curtis just <laughs> sent me. So uh, in chat, um, if you're interested, here's how to get information. It's on uh, Teaching with Zoom, Advice from the Brain. <laughs> so, um if you're on, not, online, so yes, it's online, it's free, so anybody can attend. Yeah, so if you have not reached a, a uh, point of cognitive overload by <laughs> the end of the week. Okay, um, now it's, it's after six o'clock, so in theory we're finished, but we really haven't had um, much time to just talk. So Ken, okay, those of you who want to go to something else, those of you who want to go eat dinner, those of you who who want to, um, what, see if you still have a relationship with your spouse, you know, like after spending the whole week online, um, you're, you're free to leave. Quick but note, anybody who wants to, ah. Quick note, uh, there is nothing else until seven o'clock. Ah, thank you for adding that. Um, so any, hi, and, a, and okay, in addition to the speakers, we have several other authors here, Steve Gershon, um, Diane is here, Holly, Holly I'm sorry, Holly, uh, I can't, what can't say, anyway, um, yeah, right, um, who, who else, um, is Charlie Brown still here? No. Okay. Uh, who am I forgetting? Anne. Oh, Anne, Anne, Anne is here. Um, Anne. Maida. Any questions, comments, anything else anybody wants to add? Uh, for those of you tuned into the publishing world, uh, anything coming out, uh, like uh, some fine tuning to make uh, materials uh, suitable for online teaching? Uh, like more books that, translated uh, online? What, what I will say about that is that it seems to me, not, not so much from, from the standpoint of an author, but just somebody who's interested in textbooks and the publishing world all that it seems like all or not or most or if not all of the major publishers um in this pandemic are putting out e-versions of their most popular textbooks and i know that publishers that i write for they've they've um they've already started asking me for permission which of course i've given them to distribute PDF files of the students' books for teachers who are using my textbooks. And so I think that's a great thing. And all teachers who are you know, using textbooks, you know, contact their publisher and ask them if they have an e-version or a PDF version of the student book of the textbook you're using. And I'm relatively sure they'll be happy to send it to you free. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm using a couple of Steve Gershon's uh, textbooks and uh, Cambridge, the publisher, was very, very helpful on sending me copies. I, I was fortunate, our, our Seikyo, our, our co-op, is really, really good. And they made sure the students all got physical copies of the book right away. But the publisher sent me uh, PDFs, which makes it easier when I'm teaching. Yeah. And in fact, I just got an email this morning from Cambridge that that has published my my textbook, um, telling me that they are coming out with a full ebook of my course book that will be sent free to any teachers who are already using or have already adopted the textbook. So I think there's probably other publishers that are doing that as well. So that pretty good news. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Mark, do, do, con do contact your publisher's rep. They, um, they really do want to support you. They, they, they get it. Yeah. 
Mark, you have a hand up in the uh, participants list and it is the same person in chat, Scott. So I don't know if it's the same question. Scott, maybe you can open up your mic. Sorry, the baby is screaming. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, then I'll read it for you. Okay. Uh, let's see. There it is. Uh, from Scott. Uh, certain tasks like graphic designer. Oh, wait, is this the question? Yeah, certain tasks like graphic designer seem less language focused than the other roles. How do you balance that out? And I believe that was for Curtis. I think so. Well, everybody that writes anything has to share it with the group. So they're reading, at least reading it, not always writing each other's stuff. And the graphic designer has to come up with um, uh, color scheme, character, um, and a theme to sell the tour that's differentiated and has to write about why that particular color scheme would appeal to that kind of market, such as middle-aged housewives. You know, and why these, they have to actually write English reports to defend their design theory. And I do give a two-day course in graphic design to kind of get them started on that. Right, so it's not just drawing pictures. There's definitely a lot of discussion with the group explaining it to them and other things. So. By the way, speaking of, of graphic design, tomorrow uh, Daniel Beck and I are doing uh, a session on um, presentations that don't suck the energy out of present out of your presentations, and it's which is largely about um, graphic design as part of communication, which is not directly related to your question, but they're kind of, I mean, I think graphic design and, and thinking about how we're um, visually presenting information is. Yeah, we, we do all kinds of oral presentation training. We need to do visual presentation training too. desktop publishing, uh, how to arrange elements and something that people are going to see. That's just as powerful a form of communication as anything else. And certainly connects to English. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to teach it. Other questions? You can either put them in the on our chat, or you can ask them out loud. Or great book. Oh, I have a question. Th thank you, whoever said. That. Thank you, Steve. That was me. No, but you've, you've got a, a visual thing, so the book's disappearing, I'm, right? There. Yes, it's a it's my Harry Potter thing that I can just sort of make my book Hold become up. invisible. Cool. It's awesome. Of course, yeah. it can make me invisible, too. Mm. Curtis? Um, has anybody been able to use the Zoom pre-setup breakout room function at all? I've had lots of trouble with it. It didn't work at all for me. The breakout rooms? Zoom allows you to turn in Excel files or text files. It'll pre-set up which students go to which breakout rooms. Haven't tried it. But it was a disaster for me. I'm, I think it's because, yeah, I'm not sure why. Curtis, did you check the uh, support uh, section of their website for that? I think that's where I saw how to set how to set up the forms, you know, how to write the forms. But after I put them in, students were missing, the names didn't match. There's something else, some other kind of a problem. I'm not sure what it is. By the way, this is this is not about that issue, but just about um, hacking tech problems. Um, I use Flipgrid with with almost all my classes, and, and like. Almost nobody had trouble, but one student who initially was able to, to post um, started sending me emails and said, Mark, I just can't post anything. And uh, I contacted Flipgrid and they said, said, if you have a different device, try that. If you don't, totally shut down, sign out, and then go back in. But what, what we ended up doing with this student, and we think it's just she had really bad uh, internet connection, bad Wi-Fi. She ended up making her videos on her phone 
sending them to me via wetransfer.com, which is one of those one of those free services that let, let, let you send huge files. And I was able to post them for her. And so it was, um, you know, initially I thought she's just not doing the work, but she was actually probably doing more work than a lot of other people. She was just having trouble. And I like, mm. Students can upload their own MP4 files. There's that option in Flipgrid. My students in China couldn't get enough broadband connection to record videos directly into Flipgrid, but they could record them on their phones and then upload them into Flipgrid really easily. Mm -hmm. There's an option for that in the record section. Right. Anything else? Any, anybody want have a uh, rose from that, that first thorns and roses activity that they want to share? Something that you discovered that, that uh, like, hey, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I have a rose, Shoot. which is that I always put my students into groups of four and uh, sit there and talk all the time in Japanese. And when they're in Zoom, they can't do that until they go into a chat room. Mm. Uh. Yes, they may not use English when they get in the chat room, which is one of those problems that it takes me a while to get through 22 rooms or whatever. Yeah. I, I Somebody in my group that. said that they found that the people in the breakout rooms were speaking English more than they were in live classes. Maybe because there's less pressure because of the surroundings, but that was kind of a surprise. Hmm. I had one class where, where a couple students complained to me that, that uh, you know, half the people in my group aren't doing um, aren't doing much. I mean, they're just letting, and, and any group, it's very common for the, a couple, the more talkative types to talk more, right? But yeah, that can be a, an issue and, and you can't monitor the way you do. So that comment you made is just really interesting. And Teresa, I think has her hand up. Hi, Hi. Teresa. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Mark, yeah, I, I use Mark's textbooks and uh, I did uh, use, uh, use the voice recording and the video making technique. So I got some really creative students. I don't know why they were more creative in the videos than they were in the classroom. So huh. they Interesting. props, you know, to be, and they moved around in the video and cool. it was really good. And uh, I, I used Mark, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, ben Benavides. Yeah. And the students gave me some really awesome uh, story endings for the North Fence. Uh, and they ah, used cool. graphics in the video. Some people used pictures, some people used graphics. And I thought, wow, how creative. Cool, cool. I mean, for those of you who don't know, North Fence is is a um, uh, Atami. Um, it's like choose your own adventure reader, which um, Teresa wrote, and Marcos is the publisher on that. So nice. Thank yeah, you for I, adding that. I I was really afraid to to use it online because I was like, oh, there is a digital copy, but we went face to face. We read this story. And as we were reading, just finishing the story, we went back to Zoom and I said, oh my gosh. Okay, guys, make some creative endings to the story. <laughs> cool, cool. So it's like a never ending story when, when each student or groups of students make their own endings. It was really fantastic. Hmm. So Rose. Yeah, absolutely. I think anytime we get students to create, it's like, that's so much about what we should be trying to do. Anne. Um, so this is a rose that I shared in my breakout room, but it's such a rose. Okay. Uh, you're talking about how uh, you leave your Zoom meetings open for students. Uh, well, what I did was usually when we have face-to-face -face classes, we have office hours, you know, Mine were on Fridays from 1 to 2.30, but students usually didn't come in at that time. They come in during lunchtime. So 
I just opened my lunch hour, regular time from 12, 10 to one o'clock every day. Uh, I just opened a Zoom session as office hours. So any students can stop in any time in any of my classes. And I think that was one of the best things I did because I would have students from various classes coming in, um, talking to everybody else. Um, and also when they had a question for me specifically about their class or their assignment, I put them in a breakout room with me. And then what was also that I really liked was that my third year ZEMI students were talking to my fourth year ZEMI students. And the fourth year ZEMI students were telling them, this is where you need to be with your paper right now. Do it early. You know, they were helping each other, basically. They were helping each other. And so I just left them. And whenever a student had a question, they would call for me. So I'm, I'm there doing other things. Uh, and if I am needed, I'd go. But usually I wasn't needed at all. They were, they were helping each other. So yeah. I think that was, that was my rose. Mm. I had lots of thorns. Believe me, I have lots of thorns. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other comments? I have a question. If, if anybody that's still up here uses Moodle, if you ever do like a Moodle seminar on how to really use Moodle, because at our university, it got dumped on us about March 31st. Uh, we're gonna use Moodle and we're gonna use Zoom. Although we might use GoToMeeting or we might use Microsoft, whatever. Teams. Teams and like, okay. Um, I can handle one program at a time and I can't handle three programs at a time. Okay, so Steve, I'm gonna call in my partner here, Adam. Adam, are you there? His picture is there. Ah, uh, I think he's just about to disappear. Um, well, he does. Adam Jenkins is probably, uh, at least for OTJ, the Moodle expert. Yeah, he was in my breakout group, so oh. we were talking a little bit about okay. that. So if there was somebody that you would like to have uh, do a Moodle event for you, it would be Adam. Well, Mark? Didn't Adam do a Moodle session a couple of days ago? He did, but it so, was more specific. It was more specifically about um, how he helped set up and ran the international virtual exchange. And I think Steve is looking for something that's like I need down, basic, yeah, basic stuff. Moodle one hundred and one. Yeah. And um, the closest thing that I can give you on the OTJ session, Steve, is um, let me bring up my schedule. But it's um, Friday afternoon. Uh, where are like manana? I'm sorry. Tomorrow. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, not it's not afternoon. It's in the evening, um, uh, seven o'clock. Uh, online tools and rat. Now the only reason why I'm giving that to you is because I know Adam's going to be there, and that's about um, LMSs and stuff. And it was originally supposed to feature Adam. I know he's going to be there, and uh, you can probably at least bring up this topic again. And when I speak to him, and, and I know that other people have spoken to me about this because Moodle is the LMS. It's my favorite LMS. Uh, I've seen Edmodo. I like Edmodo too. A little uh, shout out to John Helwig there. But um, if it is what you have to use, then it is what you, you should learn. And uh, I will tell Mark your request and we'll see uh, what we can do. But it's going to have to probably be outside of the OTJ summer sessions. And okay. um, yeah. And Mark, uh, oh, I, uh, okay. Uh, would it be okay if I actually talk about the social? Well, of course. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I sent you a note saying, suggesting you. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, um, probably more important uh, to the raising of my profile has not been my efforts at actually raising uh, uh, personal development or pedagogy, but the fact that on every Friday night, I uh, host a, a Zoom social where people drink a lot <laughs> and um, people seem to enjoy it, uh, maybe even more than these sessions. So guess what? We're doing that again on Friday night 
uh, immediately after that last session that I just mentioned to Steve. And I think uh, this particular week, this particular Friday night, uh, there are going to be a few more people there because of um, uh, the friends that we've made in, in the other sessions. And I think this Friday night, especially with Melody making it uh, through her, uh, through her uh, hospital stay, uh, the beer is going to taste particularly good. So I would like uh, to invite you all uh, to that social. The um, URL is posted on OTJ and I will make sure that it's an announcement uh, by around uh, Friday afternoon. And I invite you all, I've made a lot of new friends here and I would like to see you all there. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to be there. I That'd be great. That'd be great. Mm -hmm.